Welcome, everybody. I am Jeff Finn, CEO of RealMix, and I am thrilled to have you with us today. We've got a great program for you. We're still uh, welcoming some people into the room, and while we're doing that, uh, if, you, if you'd like, uh, why don't you let us know where you're coming from. Use the chat feature on the side of the, the screen and let us know. There's a lot of uh, faces that both uh, Blaine and I recognize from around the country and around the world, so it's good to see so many old friends in the audience and uh, we're really uh, glad that you you were able to join us today we've got uh, i think uh, an outstanding program for you um, to cover what is uh, a topic that is i think uh, near to everyone's heart here it's thriving how do you do better how do you do more how do you make more money how do you build better business how do you create greater success how do you optimize your performance in the commercial real estate industry. And we're delighted today to have uh, a foremost authority on the subject, uh, uh, an author, coach, trainer, industry veteran, Blaine Strickland. Uh, yeah, Blaine is a 40 year veteran of the commercial real estate industry. He's been a leader in national companies. He's built his own companies. He's been a producer, manager, consultant, coach, and instructor. And he's uh, both uh, invested in property, raising capital, uh, both on the debt and equity side, and uh, always looked to improve the practice, sort of sharpen the saw, and and figure out new ways, better ways to uh, professionalize himself and to to serve the industry. He's uh, highly qualified as an undergraduate uh, and uh, graduate from uh, Urban Economics and Real Estate from the University of Florida, CCIM designee since 1987, uh, senior instructor for CCIM and an adjunct professor from the University of Florida, UNC Chapel Hill, Rollins, and the University of Central Florida. And what we're here to talk about today is one of his latest ventures, which is an author. Uh, he's now author of the award-winning Thrive 10 Prescriptions for Exceptional Performance as a Commercial Real Estate Agent. Uh, it's gonna help you become a dominant force in your market, build yourself, build your team, build your company. Uh, Blaine, we're thrilled to have you with us and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm a big fan of the Real Next products uh, and uh, just really uh, a delight to be able to collaborate with you. Well, you know, you, you, as I talked about in the introduction, you've done so many different things and had such a successful career. What uh, led you to become an author? What was the, the, the passion there and uh, what can you tell us about Thrive? Well, I have had a multifaceted career. Uh, after I graduated from the University of Florida back in the caveman days, as I say, I went straight into commercial real estate and I've always done that. So my career now is uh, spans 40 years and uh, the last maybe decade or so I've focused on coaching and consulting. As a result of the interactions I have with various clients, I began to discover that they frequently uh, mentioned the same pains, if you will. And it was really my writing coach that helped me focus in on this idea of prescriptions, of all the words in the title. The word prescriptions is sort of the linking word. Uh, when I discovered that I was uh, frequently confronted with these similar pains from top producers, I began to think about those remedies that I frequently was involved with as we tried to resolve those pains. And so that was the idea of prescriptions. So the book really called out to me. Uh, these were ideas that I had been trafficking in for some time. And the book was just an opportunity to assemble them all in one place. Well, it's interesting. I, I know that in, in the uh, the foreword, in the uh, testimonials, people like Jerry Anderson, Ron, Rod Sanamassimo, other noted trainers and, and authorities in the industry have, have had high accolades for the the book obviously you've got a lot of ground to cover so with endorsements like that and uh, you know if, if i've read it and taken it all in as well it's it's just packed with valuable content and tremendous takeaways for the audience today so maybe let's dive in and, and talk think about a little bit if you could who is it for primarily i know you've done coaching at both the company owner manager level uh, as well as agents, but maybe if you could give a little bit of profile of who who would get the most out of it and maybe go through a little bit of what types of uh, value you know people can expect to to gain and can we share with them today some of the, the golden nuggets that you found in your research? Well, the book is only 100 pages long. It's a, If you held it in your hands, it's a relatively small book, 
But that's what I can read. So it worked out. <laughs> but the reason for that is because it's very highly focused. As I say in the introduction to the book, I wrote it specifically for uh, producers that are already in motion. It does not tell a newbie how to get started. Uh, it's not that I don't believe in newbies or want them to get off to a bad start. There are many resources for them. This book was for producers that are in the chair trying to make it happen and trying to accelerate. And so all of these prescriptions, if you will, are oriented toward helping a producing salesperson accelerate. Sometimes that means do better in what they're already doing. Sometimes it means resolving some kind of obstacle that is keeping them from um, reaching their full potential. Um, now, there is, uh, I think, an eye toward the managers. In today's world, as you know, many uh, managers, if you will, are player coaches. So they are trying to manage the office as well as produce themselves. In fact, most of them would tell you that they earn the majority of their income from uh, production. So definitely the managers are included, but just to make sure they're included, I uh, incorporated in, a, in one of the three appendices uh, a special note to them. So it really is for top performers or people that want to be top performers and their managers. And you talked about this pain diagnosis uh, prescription framework. Where did that come from? And uh, how do you maybe just talk about the, the main pain points that you 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 found and and uh, what the, the I guess the medicine that you have to take to to try to overcome and some of the, the times the, the reluctance and the challenge to take medicine and, and to uh, do what you have to do to overcome the the problem. Well, uh, with this slide that you're showing now, that every chapter has those four parts, and so uh, again, because the book is highly focused, what I wanted to ensure was that. If a reader took on a specific chapter, they could move, they could navigate through the chapter very quickly. And then if they took in more chapters, they would begin to get the cadence of the book. So that's why I decided to use the same format over and over. Every chapter, each of the big 10 chapters works the same way. The reason that I selected these four parts is because I found that if I could start with an anecdote in which I described a situation that I had been in, in other words, I was inviting the reader to join the story of someone else that I had interacted with, then they could relate to that story. They could see themselves in that situation or feel that pain, if you will. So the first uh, section, the pain, is really just um, describing it or at least inviting the reader to, to join in that conversation. The diagnosis is where I really try to explain why that pain exists. The reason you're feeling this problem because this piece is broken or this is unresolved or this was done inefficiently or incompletely. And then the prescription uh, portion of the chapter is where I try to give a very specific remedy. Um, and I think a lot of people have, I think that has resonated with a lot of the readers. Um, they recognize uh, the experience of the people that I deal with and my own experience in that part of the chapter. They realize that this is uh, very specific, very usable, very practical information. And then the final piece is the, the one more thing is my opportunity to um, help them get some perspective. Um, sometimes uh, they may say, well, I couldn't do that. Uh, or that may work for him, but it doesn't work for me. Or um, I tried that. And so what I try to do in that uh, last piece is give them a final nudge, a final nugget of encouragement. Perfect. So let's, let's start to dig in a little bit into some of the the primary areas of coverage. And one of the the main ones in, in your first chapter is on prospecting. And as you know, the the uh, the real next CRM is a an incredible tool to enable agents and companies to manage their prospect list. And sometimes we find companies have forty thousand, fifty thousand names and and companies and, and profiles, and that uh, they are in some cases managed well with lots of great information so that you can remember who you talk to about what, when you talk to them, what they're looking for, and all the information so that you can segment, parse, and, and follow up effectively. But you really talk about, as an individual agent, the need to focus in and become the brand for a, a targeted audience within that group. How do you become top of mind to a a specific segment of the, the broader audience that you're, you're going after. 
Well, there's a couple of different things happening in this chapter. As you were uh, scrolling through the chapter titles, you'll remember that the title of chapter one is something to the effect is prospecting is no fun and I'm already too busy. And so I discovered that many top agents really do very little pure prospecting, pure outward bound um, marketing, if you will, other than just simple email blasts and um, uh, social media posts and things like that, not really person to person connecting. So what I tried to do in this chapter was connect uh, a concept that is very popular in today's MBA programs, this idea of top of mind marketing. And so I lead the reader through the chapter, through this game, and I say, well, I'm gonna say a product and you say the brand that pops to mind first. And so it, the game really plays out right in the chapter. When I say pickup truck, you say Ford. When I say jeans, you say Levi's. When I say beer, you say Budweiser. When I say toothpaste, you say Crest. When I say cigarette, you say Marlboro. And so um, that is evidence of top of mind marketing. And so if you were getting a degree in marketing, you would be trying to think about how do we bring that, bring that brand equity to bear where people would say our name first. And if you'll slide to the next slide, you can see that um, I challenge uh, real estate brokers to think about maybe measuring their progress in this same way, which is, if I said to you, if you were a producer, Jeff, and I said, hey, Jeff, I'll tell you what, you pick the, you pick the 125 people, you invite them to an audience, you, you invite them to become an audience and uh, fill the theater, and I will stand on the stage, and I will shout out these products, and we'll see how much harmony we hear when I say toothpaste or beer or pickup truck or cigarette. But what would happen, Jeff, if I shouted out trusted real estate advisor, how many people would name you first? or how many people would even name you in the first five. And so um, what I discovered is that when you, when it's a lot of agents effectively said to me like, well, when you put it that way, not all that many. And so the idea of the top 125 is to pick out 125 people that you believe players, if you will, that you believe will conduct a deal over the next five years that you want to do. They are active in some way. They own something. They're, they will lease something. They'll trade something in some way. So the idea is that you effectively foretell the future. You pick out 125 people that you think will do a deal, and then you set your sale to capture as many of those 125 deals uh, as you can over the next five years. It, wouldn't it be great if we could predict that carefully or that accurately? And the idea is, is that in order for people to name you first, for you to be top of mind, you have to, in my opinion, make four high quality touches on that person per year. Four times you have to have an interaction with that person in which something meaningful happens. So that is not an email blast. Uh, that's uh, rarely a text message. It means that there's been true interaction. So it works like this. The math works like this, which is that uh, if you have 125 people and you're going to touch each of them once per quarter, and you think about a quarter as being uh, 13 weeks long, you eliminate one week for vacation and holiday, that leaves you with 12 weeks, 12 weeks times five work days is 60 work days in a quarter, 125 people that you have to touch over 60 days means that you have to touch two people per day. So back to the title, what I'm offering to these uh, busy, productive producers is, hey, how about this for a prospecting system? Let's pick the people out in advance and then let's say to ourselves, yeah, I can do two per day. I can, I can find a place in my schedule to reach out and touch two people in a meaningful way per day. And as you do that, what you think about is that you are making a deposit in the top of mind bank. The idea is that you may call them on a day when they say, wow, it's great that you called. I really have a need or thank you for pointing out that there's an opportunity here for me. But many times they will not be ready to move immediately. But again, if your point is to make a deposit in the top of mind bank, what it means is, is that when the need arises, you will be top of mind and they will call you. Think about it. If you made a touch uh, four times a year on someone for, let's say, three years, that would be 12 touches. Do you think if I went to that person at the three-year mark and said, trusted real estate advisor, that they would name you first? And the chances are probably so. And if I pressed you further and said, so Jeff, 
How many other brokers do you think have had meaningful touches with them? And the answer would be very few. So this has been a very uh, powerful tool for top brokers. All of the top brokers, and by the way, there are a couple that I can see that are uh, on this webinar, are users of this system. And it has been extremely effective because it, it creates a very finite target for them. They can get it done. And then their results are very, very powerful. Well, yeah, clearly, in the real estate industry, everyone talks about it as a relationship business. And it's, there's an art, and people need to build great relationships and do what they do. But there's a science to it as well. And that's, I think, what you're talking about. There's a real methodology, and you have to do the blocking and tackling and the, the fundamental work to, to build those relationships, maintain them, and, uh, and, 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 and do it consistently and with, yeah. with a process and a flow to it. Yeah, I and I, one of the things that you also talk about is workflow and and process and project management and how uh, people build buildings and you think of that okay that's you know architecture and science but you relate it to real estate and and selling relationships and building relationships in a similar way we have inside of Real Next a, a timeline a time management tool which allows you to build workflows so that every time you get a listing or every time you meet someone at a networking event or every time you sign a lease, you can program in the 20 or 30 or however many different things that you need to do and when you need to do them because you can't remember it all. It's, it's too much. You, there's so many pieces of a, a project and for a process to be optimized. Talk to us about project management and your, your uh, Gantt chart concept of how you, how you apply it to commercial real estate. Yeah, the after the great recession, we've now sort of enjoyed the great recovery. And so many brokers are having their best years ever. And now they're three, four, five years into that path. And what I often see as I wander the country is that the ability of these really top producers, their, their ability to get the business is stronger than their ability to execute the business. In other words, they have five, 10, 15 assignments, but the, but the strain comes when they can't execute clearly uh, and efficiently on all of those assignments. Sometimes they build a team around them to help with that. But what I found was a general weakness in the arena of trying to think through a systematic, replicable, duplicatable way to execute projects efficiently. And there's, there's mutual benefit there. If you execute the listing or the representation assignment effectively, two parties are happy. You're happy, but so is your client. They, in other words, both parties want the same. So the purpose of this little illustration is, of course, is that moms are the ultimate project managers. And the, you see the first inkling of a Gantt chart there on that illustration, which is that mom knows that she can do something simultaneously uh, like maybe feed the children, as an example, um, but she doesn't give the children a bath until she's fed the children. She doesn't read them a bedtime story until she's gotten them through the bath. So the idea of this illustration really was just to say, this is not a particularly foreign concept to us. We use this in our in our lives every day. If you click through to the next slide, then what I'm encouraging people to think about is um, this guy, uh, Gantt, uh, created this tool 100 years ago, and there's, it's still the dominant project management tool. And it's simply a visual illustration of the sequencing of key events. So what I like to say to brokers sometimes is that every building that you have ever sold or leased was constructed using a Gantt chart. Every architect, every project engineer, every contractor uses a Gantt chart to get these buildings built. Then when it comes to us, where we're going to take what was built for $5 million and sell it for $10 million, all of a sudden we're somehow not in the Gantt chart business. And yet many brokers will tell you that to uh, work through a sale process or a tenant representation process, you ask them to list out the steps and there'll be 30, 40, 50 steps in their process. Well, that's where the collision occurs, which is a process that has 30, 40, 50 steps and yet no overwhelming, over, overarching, I should say, guide in terms of how to get those things done uh, is where the problem is. So the idea is why wouldn't we take a cue from our professional allies, the architects, the contracts, the engineers, and use the same tool they do, just apply their tool to our project. And so that's why I have uh, been on this campaign to see if I can 
invoke this idea. Now, I will just quickly say that Gantt charts are not necessarily easily produced in, in software on, on software, although there's many software programs that do it, including RealNext, which has a version of it. Um, so this is a great way to integrate your team members um, so that you can um, take advantage of assistance. And so when you look at a Gantt chart, you may not be responsible for every line. You might be responsible for the overall execution, but a Gantt chart also enables you to parse out individual responsibilities to your various team members. So it's not only causes the project to become more effectively delivered, it's very strong in terms of allocating resources to the challenge. What I found in my history in the industry was that this doesn't simply enable you to execute more efficiently and consistently to do it as fast as possible and effectively as possible. But by demonstrating that you're going to work this way, you win more business. When clients see that you have a process and you're actually going to do all of this work, they say, that's unbelievable they don't understand all of the work that goes into a, a project and that they've got an accountable, responsive control system that you can enable. And I, I agree with you 100% by using this tool, and particularly in a team environment where you have, you know, here's all the tasks that need to be done. You can make sure they're done. You can report on them again and report against them to your client and let them know that they were done. It's 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 a way to to build brand, build integrity, because a lot of brand, as you talked about earlier, was about consistency of service delivery, is that they know that they can depend on what Crest is or what that that car was. And if they think that they're just going to get a random service or they're not sure what the service is, you you can't build the reputation that you, you talked about earlier. Yeah, I'll give you a couple really quick anecdotes. Um, I had a discussion with one client who really began to like this idea and see the power of it. And as we were looking at his existing listing presentation, it was 100 pages long, probably 40 of which were boilerplate. And so I challenged him to see if we could get it down to 20 pages and then to 10 and then to five. And the ultimate bet we made is that he could win the listing on one piece of paper, the mm -hmm. Gantt chart. Just that, yep. Because it's so compelling to the owner, to, to the- What you're gonna do when you're gonna do it. Yeah, and it's uh, you mentioned that it's uh, very effective in winning the business. It's also, you, you know, what do you think is the most common critique, a criticism that I hear from owners about their brokers? And it's that I don't hear from the guy. Well, mm -hmm. what this does is it organizes the reporting process. In other words, on this chart, you can exactly. say, look, if we talk on June 22nd, we're gonna be talking about the roof. And if we're not talking about the roof, the project is something's gone wrong. So it, it really focuses everybody in on the accomplishment of the task. And in the analogy, this is for the uh, the architecture, but look at, you know, what are the marketing steps? What are the tour steps? What are the inspection steps? What are the contracting steps? All of the, the different parts of the process that that uh, need to to apply. Yeah. You can build the same exact workflow yeah. for for a transaction. Now exactly. we, we need to move on. We, there's just so much here. We've got to we could we could dive deep into each one of these subjects. But I want to make sure we cover a few of the highlights and uh, make sure people get as much value as they can. Getting in front of an audience is a, an incredible way to to build your your reputation and to demonstrate your expertise. And you call it the power to convene, and particularly in front of trade organizations. How do you get people? Is is that for everybody? Is it just for some people? Do you really have to have this dynamic uh, speaking ability? You can can uh, can everybody on the the call here take advantage of the power to convene? Well, the the idea of the power to convene, by the way, and the reason there's a picture of Congress on the slide here is because it's actually in the United States Constitution. It gives the the president the power to convene the Congress if he he or she needs a decision to be made. And of course, now we do that slightly differently. And of course, decisions get made on the front page of the newspaper and via Twitter, I guess. But the president does have the power to call everyone together. What I discovered, Jeff, is that when you segregate the really top producers in their marketplace, they are all using uh, power to convene very effectively. Um, what what I discovered is that they have some form of event or activity which causes the customer to move their feet. In other words, the customer effectively comes to them. 
because the producer creates some kind of event or some kind of activity that has very high value. And so uh, when the customer comes to you, it changes the dynamic of the relationship. Um, so if you'll click to the next slide, I'll show you some of those, some of those things. Um, the reason that I have the big green egg there is hopefully some of our listeners uh, recognize that as a very expensive cult-like uh, product that people that pay $1,000 for that little bad boy, when you could buy a, a grill that has the same utility for a third of that, why do people pay so much more? And it's because there's brand equity. In other words, people really want that big green egg experience. Well, top producers have mimicked that same experience <clears throat> And it has these benefits that you see on the screen. It distinguishes you from the mass. I was at a, uh, I, I made a presentation on this topic to a trade organization. And because I have the ability to poll the audience, I asked them, how many of you over the last month have been face to face with a client? And it was a very small percentage. Then I asked, how many of you have put on a special event for a client over the past year? Again, a very small percentage. And by small, I mean like 10%. So what happens is, is that if you're willing to try to create an event or an activity, it will distinguish you from the mass. Frankly, nobody else is doing it. Um, when you get people to the ball game or to the special event or out on the sailboat, then there's a very strong relationship building opportunity. It's a very valuable learning experience because they will end up saying things to you that you can't learn any other way. They may say, hey, I was talking to my neighbor, uh, you know, two doors down uh, where my office building is, and he was telling me this or that. And you, you could prospect for 100 years and never learn that. So because they get relaxed, they begin to share things with you. When you do these fun things and you spend a little time, a lot of times you end up talking about kids and dogs and spouses, and that changes the relationship. One um, agent told me that uh, he absolutely believes in the activity that he has created. And what's happened to him through the years is that he has morphed in the eyes of his, of the people that he does business with from broker, meaning I get paid to transact a, a service, <clears throat> to advisor, meaning that they call and ask, what do you think I should do, to friend. And he said, so now it's, it's the lines are completely blurred. I'm at the ball game or on the boat or fishing or hunting or whatever it might be with friends. And when you compare what you spend and the time that you invest, you get unbelievable return on investment. So I'm a big fan of uh, thinking about how am I using my power to convene? How can I create brand equity? How can I call my posse, my tribe together? It's interesting. And as you pointed out, and I think we could talk a little bit more about it, there, there's so many different ways to do it. You don't need to... Uh, speak in front of a large group if you're uncomfortable that way. Uh, but if you are comfortable, that's one way. You can build your own event. You can go to an industry event. It's a, you can do forums like we're doing right now. You know, Tell us about some of the different ideas that you seem to uh, work most effectively. Well, some of us have been around long enough to remember a book that was written about 18 years ago called Never Eat Alone. And that book has had a revival. It just was republished about two years ago. So the very simplest way is just to have a meal with somebody. And all of us know this, which is that when you break bread with people, uh, defenses come down. I, I, I sometimes uh, <laughs> attribute it to the fact that because I have to chew, I can't be talking. <clears throat> and since I can't talk, I have to listen. So just the chewing creates just a little slower pace, a little more learning, a little more listening, a little more empathy. You could do these lunch and learns. I, a lot of my clients will, um, here's, a, here's a quick anecdote. There's a market that this guy is in. He thinks the market is about to turn down. And so what he's done is create a presentation on the market. And he calls up the lenders in the area and says, look, I don't know when the downturn is going to come. But if it does, you guys might be the early warning system when, when, when uh, borrowers can't make their debt payments. So you may be forced to start thinking about how to help them. And on a worst case basis, you might be thinking about REO. And so he's having these lunch and learns with banking staffs um, and they are very well attended. The people love it. He said 50% of the time, somebody calls him back the next day and goes, hey, uh, you know, we really enjoyed your presentation. Could you stop by next Tuesday? Uh, the market update used to be a big deal. When I managed the CBRE office in Fort Lauderdale, we put on the annual market update in the Cypress Creek Hotel, and and you know we we had to close the doors. We couldn't we couldn't offer seats to everybody. It was so popular. Now, what I think has been sort of confusing to some people is CBRE now puts out a 
I don't know, 95 page, full color, beautiful global market forecast PDF. And what I see is people mass mailing that. It's like, yeah, no, I do that. I, I put out a market update. I go, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm, I email it to over 1500 people. Well, that's not the same as calling people together and interacting with them. Uh, webinars like this, I've put on several myself. Um, the software enables anyone really to put on a webinar or a podcast. Uh, Roundtable, um, I have a friend, I mentioned this in the book, I have a friend that called a group of people together for a two-day event in a, in a beach town and they um, gather around the table and um, everyone's relaxed and they come, they were kind of handpicked. So they bring different perspectives to the table. Very, very powerful. And people would call and say, hey, I'm trying to work out a ski trip with my kids. When is that going to be again? Hmm. They, um, they don't want to miss it. They don't want to miss it. It's very magnetic. I mean, talk about moving your feet. They're calling you and saying, hey, I don't want to miss it. A special well, interest. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the one of the things that I have found that and I was actually just talking to a friend that has just completed one of these. That sometimes you, you see where you want to be in five years and don't get started, so you never get there. So something like you just talked about, you know, you, you start small and you you grow, and you just need to, you know, people shouldn't be intimidated to think, well, I can't get an audience of, you know, ten, twenty, or even you know, five hundred people to a market update. But you know, maybe I, I do a small roundtable to start with, or it's that yeah, special interest yeah, event to get started. Yeah, if you're younger and newer in the business, start at the level that you're at. In other words, if you're not talking to the bank president, you're only talking to one of the lenders, or maybe you're only talking to one of the analysts. Start there. Uh, I, I got news for you. Time will progress. You will progress. They will progress. Um, there, there's a way for you to find a way to get involved. But the two, the easiest two are the next ones where you have a special interest event or a trade organization event. A special interest event um, might be a, you know, try to get yourself uh, in line to speak at a, a, a commercial real estate forum. Um, I'm very involved with the CCIM program, and I can't tell you how often I see young people uh, get their designation and then continue on to move into uh, leadership. And so as a result, all of a sudden, they're the president of their district, which has 30 or 40 or 50 people. They get quoted in the newspaper. Um, they get invited to be panelists on other in other trade organizations, et cetera. The final one um, is just to give you an idea that you, the trade organization event may not even be in your arena. I worked with a client in Washington who did a tremendous amount of work with medical professionals, particularly dental uh, um, professionals. He made a few appearances there, but he struck gold when he started going to the annual convention of the CPAs and then started talking about real estate. Every CPA wanted to come to the real estate um, concurrent session and hear what was going on in real estate or <clears throat> maybe specifically hear about how their clients could start to use certain methodologies or legal entities to accomplish um, certain functions. And what he said he learned, what he didn't realize was how dependent the, the, the dentists are on their CPAs for very specific guidance, including their cash register systems. And so um, I would just encourage you to scour the opportunities that are out there. Well, that also plays to the, this point of specialization and, and needing to, 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 to not be a generalist. Because if, you, if you're a biotech person or a logistics person, it's it's great to speak at a real estate conference, but if you can speak at a biotech conference or participate there, you're going to demonstrate both your commitment to their industry and your your expertise in in a, in a different way to a totally different audience. Yeah, the other thing, of course, is that um, in effect, what you're doing is allowing someone else to serve as your administrative assistant and assemble these 100, 200, 300 people for you, and then you just show up. <laughs> you don't yeah. even have to use your yeah. own team to create the event. I was re recruited, recruiting guy a little bit different, but it, it, it deals with maybe the, the lunch and learn or some of the other points and what mm -hmm. you're up against when you're up against the top producers that mm -hmm. the agents in New York sort of look at a score sheet. I don't know if, if they're doing this in, in other markets, but something to think about where basically you have breakfast, coffee, lunch, uh, maybe a drink and dinner, and you get more points for, for dinner and lunch, but and, and breakfast. So to have those face-to-face -face meetings and the time where you're 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 listening and the other guys the other person's talking but those five opportunities per day 
five days a week or 25 incredible opportunities. And if you're not taking advantage of each one of them, they're, they're kicking themselves. They, they missed a, a hit. That, well, that would, those are each opportunities to be up to bat in, in front of someone. And if they missed any of them during the week, they were you know, well, not fulfilling their, their, oper- their potential. Exactly. And if you, so if you blend that mentality with your top 125 list, it becomes pretty easy to figure out not only what activities you're going to perform, you're going to go to lunch or dinner or have drinks, but you also know who to do it with. That's Imagine the purpose. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's keep going. Now, you talk about assistance. I talk about leveraging your time and, and, and building a team and the, the ways to build a team and to not build uh, redundancy, but to build extension and extensibility. Um, give us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the team concept and, and how we can take most advantage of assistance or other colleagues to, to work together to, to leverage. Well, as these top producers have become more and more um, productive, it doesn't take long until they bump into the edge of their own capabilities and they have to build teams around them. <clears throat> In fact, the book is divided into three parts. The, the middle part is called Build a Team Around You. And um, I frequently am called on to try to resolve this issue. And many times the first teammate or perhaps a very important teammate is this assistant. And so I run into situations where somebody will say, well, I've had two assistants, neither of them worked out. So I need another one, but I, I don't know what to do. And, and, uh, or I hired an assistant, but you know she's not working out very well. In some cases, the illustration on the right is to show you that when I go and uh, get involved, sometimes I find that the assistant is the one that is so unhappy because there's such a mismatch between the expectations, the training, the compensation. And so um, I would just tell you that in general, an industry uh, made up of salespeople uh, who are highly motivated, sometimes conduct their business in sort of an ADD fashion, it's tough to be an assistant. And so therefore we have to work harder at aligning ourselves with what we need and finding the person that can, that can succeed in the role that we want them to. And it's a common, that's why there's two chapters in the book in terms of how to hire and then work with an assistant. You mean, you think about the, um, the types of people that are, you talk about the ADD person, that's sort of the, the dynamic driven salesperson and, and how they would collaborate. Should they find another person like themselves or a, a polar opposite? And how do you do that and, and make sure that you're, you know, if they are different and give you the other side of yourself, of a team, how do you, how do you work together? How do you, you bridge that? Well, there, there, I wouldn't say there's a standard formula. Um, many times uh, the most effective teams have complementary personalities where you have maybe a, an outwardly facing uh, salesperson and an inwardly facing assistant. Sometimes you have a creative, productive, throw it at the wall, see if it, it sticks salesperson and you have a detail oriented, systematic, get a receipt, make sure the numbers add up um, assistant. But what I propose in the book is that you, as the producer, you go into the hiring and utilizing uh, mindset like this. Uh, 35 years ago, Stephen Covey wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's still a New York Times bestseller. When you get to habit number three, put first things first, he unveils this idea of the four quadrants. If you just Google uh, Covey's four quadrants or even just four quadrants, you'll get well over a million hits. So this idea is deeply embedded in um, global time management thinking. The idea is, as you can see kind of on this screen, that the quadrants are numbered one, two, three, four. Uh, Quadrant one, urgent and important, means that this is the whirlwind, as Covey calls it, where you have to get it done today. And a lot of um, productive agents in a blossoming market are in quadrant one. They have to get it done today. They only get paid if the deal closes, deal must close in order to get paid, therefore focus entirely on the deal. But quadrant two is the one that Covey holds up for us to consider, which is the quadrant that is important but not urgent. If you're listening to this webinar right now, you're in quadrant two because you're absorbing information that could be valuable to you, but it's not urgent. In fact, some people are not attending right now because they're they're in quadrant one and hopefully they'll find a moment in quadrant two where they can listen to the archive. So the idea that I would put forward for you as you think about building your team is to think down this path 
number one, you can't avoid quadrant one. You're going to have some time in quadrant one. However, you can measure your time management health by the amount of time that you get in quadrant two. So quadrant two for a commercial real estate agent is prospecting, learning, exercising, reading, sleeping, creating processes, honing um, templates, creating checklists. The purpose of time in quadrant two is to soothe the frustration, the chaos in quadrant one. Just imagine what it would be like if you and your assistant sat down and created what appeared to be sort of a standard process or a checklist so that when you both were in quadrant one and, and your hair was on fire, you could refer back to the checklist and allow it to guide you through the process. And both of you could anticipate what's going to happen next. But finally, the, um, I think the thing that I see more than any other is this concept of I've got to find somebody I can delegate stuff to. And if you use simply that concept, which is I need to offload this off my desk and onto somebody else's desk, uh, I get that in terms of I don't have time to stand at the copy machine. I don't have time to fill out an expense report. Yes. Can we train somebody else to do that? Yes, we can. But what you really want to focus on is not delegating, finding someone to whom you can delegate, but someone who can not only receive those tasks, but then improve those tasks or enhance the process of those tasks. So what I say is don't settle for mere delegation. Focus on acceleration. Find someone who has the horsepower to say, I see how we're doing it. I wonder if we could do it better. That's where the real accretive nature of having an assistant. Accretive means one plus one equals three. That's really power productivity. That's that's great stuff. And it really plays into that, that um, the Gantt chart as well, by really controlling your day. So that Gantt chart didn't only apply to how do you run a, a transaction? How do you run business development? Really, how do you run your, your business as a professional, or, or you know, whether you're a manager or an agent, and you're controlling your time? Yeah, imagine what it would be like if all of you on the team were looking at the same chart and able to look and see, wow, I've got to get this done so the next task can start on time, or checking on the person who's getting that task done so you can start on time. Imagine what that would be like. One of the things that, that the, and by the way, everyone, we have about 15 minutes left. We could have uh, time for Q&A. Start thinking about your, your questions, anything that you want to post, please put it in the, the box. We just have a couple of more, a couple more uh, slides to go through, and then we're going to be open for, for Q&A. But uh, in, in Real Next, in our, our CRM, we've got a, a tremendously powerful pipeline management tool so that you know every opportunity that you're pursuing, every suspect, every lead, uh, you know, where everything stands in a pipeline. and how you're managing your your business to know where you need to focus and the the type the type of business that you've got and what you need to do to make sure you're hitting your your numbers both on the numbers of number of calls or activities as well as the number of deals to realize your uh, financial objectives and you talk a lot about that that pipeline management tool and how it it helps to assure productivity well, in effect, it's the if you ask me the singular message of the book, I would say, well, Jeff, there's three chapters in the book on the pipeline report. So I think uh, I think I'd have to say, if there was only one takeaway, it would be the need to uh, have a, a viable, effective, powerful cash flow projection tool. So people say pipeline report. Um, and I would just offer you this idea. Uh, I'm friends with Rod Santamassimo. He wrote the forward to the book. Rod has a giant coaching organization. Probably many of you are, uh, you've interacted with the Massimo group in some way. Uh, Rod told me one time that he estimated that about 50% of the people that came to the Massimo group for one-on-one -on -one coaching arrived without a pipeline report, um, which is just stunning because if it you is amazing. Think if you think about it, all of the companies that we work with, whether you are in the retail world, office world, hospitality, whomever, all of them run their businesses with, with uh, budgets and cash flow projections. <laughs> and here we are uh, without one. So as a result, we're already in a very dynamic corner of the world. We work on big deals that have lots of opportunities to fail, and we don't get paid until everything goes right. We get paid at the end. It's a very long deal cycle. So we spend a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out how we're going to manage uh, our home life. Um, and, and it could be so easily salved if we created a pipeline report. So if you'll look at the next slide, you'll see that um, I just tried to um, 
think about some ideas here. Um, I offer one in the, if you don't have one, you can read about one in the book and there is someone you can go to in the book and he'll send you the one that I developed, which was just intended to be, if you don't have anything else, um, if you're a Massimo client, then they have one. If you're a real next client, then they have one. So it's, it, it's not a specific brand that I'm after as much. It's the attention to the issue that you would use one. So the way that you make it work, work most powerfully is you log the extensive detail about each possible opportunity. You then project the cash flow that will be out in front of you. With all of that data that you've collected, you can mine the data. You can begin to see, as an example, who do you do most of your work with? How long does a typical deal take? Um, do you make more money in leasing or sale? In which zip code do you make the most money? I like to tell people, in fact, the chapter of this title is, I dread this time of year because I always have to start over. And the anecdote that goes along with that is that I was working with a senior guy and it was right about this time of year. And he's like, I hate this time of year. And I said, why? And he said, well, there's three weeks left in the year. I'm at the highest tranche in my commission earning capability. In other words, you know, it's 50, 50 up to some number and then 60, 40 and then 70, 30. So he's getting 70% of the money that he brings in right now. And the way he looked at it was four weeks from now, I will be back to 50, 50. It's just so painful to have to start over every year. Well, when we created a pipeline report, he was actually going to make so much money that by February 15th, he would be back to 70-30. So my point is the best medicine is to keep track of it and you'll know exactly how, if, if you don't like having to go to 50-50, well, at least you can measure it and manage it because you know how long it's going to take until you can move into the next tranche. But ultimately, data, data makes a lot of difference. Yeah. Ultimately, I would just tell you as a guy who's been married for 39 years, uh, this gives you an opportunity to share this with your stakeholders internally and externally. I make the point <laughs> in the book that you can share it with your manager, but you can share it with your spouse as well. Um, they may or may not like it, but you can address it together if everybody knows what the deal is and knows what the That's situation the reality. is. That's the reality. So yep. you know what you're facing and what you need to do. What, how, do you, how do you change yeah. it? Exactly. You, you know you've got a problem or you know you're, you're good to go and yep. you've got it in front of you. Just know, you know where you need to focus your time. Uh, there are a couple of questions coming in. We, we, and we Before everybody uh, looks to break, we're going to have a couple of special offers for you before you, you jump. So don't jump yet. Uh, if you are a new agent in the business, Blaine, how, how can you, I, I, you can't afford an assistant. Some are uh, concerned that, that, you know, they're just not able to get there yet. How do they leverage? You know, are there, are virtual assistants good ideas? Sure. Is, is there other ways to collaborate? How, you know, how, how would you recommend yeah. a, a young agent? Well, Make it what out. I often what I often recommend, and in the book, by the way, there are one of the appendices has a collection of books that I think you should read, and I frequently put point people to the E Myth Revisited, another 35 year old book, and in that book, the author Michael Gerber says, look, here's here's how you here's how you start a business. On day one, you create an org chart for how the business should look when it is running at full speed. You create that org chart, and you put your name in every box. On day two, you come in, you pick a box, and you start working to get your name out of that box. And so what I would tell the youngest players that are on the uh, record here on the webinar with us is, is that, you know, think big, envision big, and then work toward a very specific outcome in the future. That would be your best bet as opposed to just running headlong like everyone around you. You know, it's like fire drill. And, and so what you must do is gather yourself and step out of the fray for a moment and envision where you want to go. What you see here on this screen, um, if you want me to just keep going quickly, Jeff, is that um, yep. the book is available in three different formats. Um, it sells normally for $25 as a hardcover. There's an offer uh, right now to get the book for 30% off at Amazon. Perfect. So you just need that uh, special offer code. <clears throat> yeah, and... it, which is CRE Holiday. It's all caps. Just type it in the promo code. It'll take it right off. And then you're, you're uh, not resting. Looks like you, you've got something. More to come and coming I am, quickly. I am really, really excited about book number two. The first book is called Thrive. The second book is called Adapt. <clears throat> Thrive sort of looks at where we are. Adapt looks at where we'll go. And so in Thrive, I identify nine forces that I think are going to bring uh, disruption to the commercial brokerage industry. And, and by disruption, I mean specific to our industry, not, hey, technology is going to change things. Um, so... Uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm right at the uh, doorstep of going through the publishing process. It'll be ready in March 2020. Uh, I've had many beta readers, a couple are on this uh, call right now, 
and I've gotten great feedback. I'm very excited about this. Well, so are we. We're looking forward to it, and I think you promised, and I hope I can hold you to it, that in March or April, right around the publication date, you'll be back with us to share your your findings and your work and your your recommendations based on the the new book. Absolutely. I um, a part of the work that I did to write this book was conduct focus groups. So I've already started building the audience, and so I finally was able to sort of stop myself and gather all this information together and and get it in one volume. And as you can see, it's sort of the sister volume to Thrive. And I would love to come back and share it with our listeners. Well, that would be awesome. We look forward to it. And um, we we are still open for questions. We have a couple minutes left, but it looks like. Uh, Let's see. Uh, can we pre-order the book? That's a good thing. And uh, you got the, you've got a fan club out there growing. So well, well done, <laughs> Lane. Appreciate that. Appreciate your your support, Austin, and the rest of the group. There's so many of you out there that are uh, good to 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 be joining us. And don't leave yet. We've got another special offer for you from Realnex. So we want to thank you for joining. We want to thank you for your 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 loyalty as whether you're an existing customer or potentially a new customer. If you're a, potential new customer sign up by the end of the year for the real next suite and we'll give you a free month and we also have a, a e-marketing campaign tool for uh, your listing uh, marketing to our national database of over 100,000 prospects so we'll give you a free national real blast we call it and a, a free month with your your annual subscription and if you're already a, su a subscriber which many of you are then we'll give you a buy one get one with a real blast so if you purchase by uh, the end of the year, we'll give you a free uh, Real Blast campaign to send out your your listings to the uh, the Real Next community. Just use Thrive 2020 as your coupon code when you order. We've got a website set up to go to and fill out a form, and we'll we'll have somebody call you or use the phone number on the bottom of the screen and um, or on our website, and you can you can uh, talk to a salesperson and they can help you get started. So. We really appreciate your time, Blaine. Great stuff. We appreciate everyone in the audience. For those of you that might have some friends that want to learn more about Thrive, we're going to send out a recording link with a highlight reel and uh, full full access to the, the session so that you can review it and share it. And for those that, that weren't able to make the, the session, uh, which some, some weren't, we'll send it out to them as well. So we'll keep you posted on future Real Next webinar events and certainly the the upcoming adapt session that we'll, we'll have and we'll get Blaine back here to share more of his insights with us so thanks again everyone thanks Blaine we appreciate it and hope you all have very very happy holidays and a, and a great new year thanks Jeff it was really great to be with you and to uh, collaborate I appreciate it very much you bet we'll talk to you soon bye-bye